now, an eighth special presentation. In this edition of Artbeat Nation, we get a look into the secret lives of musicians. Here, I think it just gives them a different background and a different approach from where they're coming from. A feminist painter breaks down gender barriers in the art world. Thinking about like women's work and how women have been making artwork forever. An artist captures the darkest hours of a prisoner's life. It makes us stand still and think. Think about something we don't really want to think about. And we meet an artist grappling with notions of conformity. Going back indoors is like going backwards a little bit to me. Your audience is, it's because it's, it starts reducing the audience. It's all ahead on this edition of Art Beat Nation. Funding for Art Beat Nation is made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you. What started as the Scottsdale Baroque Orchestra has morphed into a chamber orchestra known for its collaborative and experimental concerts. Reporter Lori Allen attended a recent concert and discovered that not only is Arizona pro art unique, some of its members are too. Word is getting out about the Valley's Chamber Orchestra, Arizona Pro Art. Its most recent concert attracted a full house. <laughs> By night, these musicians are rock stars. Well, make that orchestra stars. But by day, most support themselves with another job. Sure, some play in a band and others teach music. Then there's this guy. Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. And she's always gone too long Anytime she goes away He's Robert Lee. He's been playing the French horn since he was eight. By day, he's in information security. You know, I, I worked as a penetration tester for a number of years and even had my own penetration testing company. And if, if you're not familiar with that term means, essentially I got paid to break into companies. Uh, all legal, of course. I, I got paid by the company that I was breaking into, but we were testing how good their security was. So in, in that part, uh, you know, the, the patterns, the logic, the, uh, the mathematical part of music definitely translated. And, you know, if I'm thinking of a difficult problem, I can go play music for a little bit and by the end of a session, maybe come up with the solution that I, I was struggling with. And so when you think about a typical day in the life for you three years from now, what would it look like? Debbie Exner is a coach and a speaker. Except when she's playing the bass, that's right, the big instrument. At the time in high school, I think it was, it, it was exciting that it was such a large instrument and that I could carry it. And it's, that appeal's gone now. The most commonly asked question is, don't you wish you played the flute? I like the really low sounds. I think it's Gary Carr that talked about it sounding like chocolate. And I just really love that warm, rich sound. And, and the role that the bass plays in any, you know, first of all, it's a very versatile instrument. It's used in lots of different kinds of music. And the role that it plays in the orchestra kind of is the foundation. So I just enjoy that process and that that role very much. Okay. Speaking can be a lonely job, so Exner appreciates the collaboration of Arizona Pro Art. Playing with an orchestra is just a magical experience. You're a piece of this huge tapestry of sound, and it's really fantastic to see it all come together. Exner says being a musician makes her better in the workplace. You're, you're listening to what's going on in the orchestra, you're watching the conductor, you're looking at the music and what's on the printed page, and you are adapting and adjusting as you go along. And I think those skills are really helpful as a speaker to read the audience and see where things are going. And as a coach, to hear the changes in someone's vocal inflection or the way they're breathing or to get, you know, sense cues about how they're sitting with whatever it is that you're talking about at that time. So I think it does help. It sharpens your senses 
and helps you to use all your senses so that you can do a more effective job. The conductor says the unusual professions found in his orchestra can be an advantage. It gives them different background experiences because we find in music, even through composers like Charles Ives, who was an insurance agent, and Alexander Borodin, who was a chemist, they were still able to produce wonderful music and just amazing works while still having a different day job. So really, I, I don't think in terms of better or not better, it really applies here. I think it just gives them a different background and a different approach from where they're coming from. And different defines not only the musician's day jobs, but Arizona pro art itself. Uh, some of the other things we do are, are collaborations with silent films. We work with different uh, artists that are singers or actors. All throughout the season, we have a large variety of what we do, but at our core, we still have really great musical ensemble that everything is built around. We have a reach that's just even beyond the valley. We have an international call for scores where composers from around the world enter our competition. We received one today from Brazil and another one from Japan. So we're not only just making an impact here, we're making an impact globally. For more information, visit azproart.org. Artist Stephanie Rond is a painter, curator, and punk rock musician. She describes herself as a feminist painter and often incorporates messages from 1950s advertising in her work. Up next, we hear about her journey as an artist and social activist. I actually got started in art probably in 10th grade is when I became very serious about it. I've always been into art. That's where I felt like my voice was strongest. I always like a new challenge of how to say what I want to say in a new way. I use paints that are man-made. There's something about the aesthetic of that plastic quality that I am drawn to. And I also do a lot with old advertisements from the 50s. It's already something that's in our culture, and I like taking that and making a new story with it. I researched probably thousands of 50s ads to find the ones that I wanted to use. To me, that search helps bring in the story. With the new work that I'm doing, it's very text involved. I was in a punk rock band for five years, and that kind of changed what I thought about the written word as a way to get people to start the story where I want them to start the story in my paintings and then jump off from that text. I have been a feminist painter for the past probably 17 years. I feel like that's where my voice is in my artwork, is um, talking about the inequalities that still exist between men and women. Discussing gender and humor go together, because I want people to be comfortable with the artwork right away and then kind of see that there's an underlying topic there. So I've always been interested in the female aspect of art making and, and the idea of handmade craft and thinking about like women's work and how women have been making artwork forever. It's not really considered an art form. I really like the idea of the labor behind lace or cross stitch or embroidery. Street art and graffiti is actually the other half of the artwork that I'm making right now. That's a very male-dominated art style, but I like taking the styles that they're using and incorporating it into my work. So it's kind of two separate things that talk to each other. If I can make artwork where people can have discussions about inequality, it doesn't matter race, gender, sexual preference, we should all be considered equals. I enjoy making art spaces where they don't exist to kind of give quality back to the community. There's definitely an art to putting a show together and making sure that this piece that's next to this piece is talking correctly. The first place I started curating at was the Carnegie Gallery, which is at the main library. And they had built a gallery, but they weren't putting art in there. So I asked to start getting nonprofits to come in and have shows. With 2,000 people coming into the library every day, that's a huge audience. The kind of art that I bring to the Carnegie are actually large organizations, large nonprofits. For example, the Ohio Art League 
or Roy G. Bev. And what we do there is we put out a call for entry and we will have 40 to 50 artists look at a theme to go into the show. Holy Craft is actually a newer venture. It is a handmade goods store. It's actually part of the DIY, kind of the punk rock culture. It goes along a lot with my artwork. It's got a lot of wit and humor. It's not your grandmother's craft store. We wanted to have this gallery because there isn't much difference between craft and art, so it was just a natural progression to put art and craft together. Some of the challenges that I face working as an artist today is the economy. The art world's getting very hit by that. People don't realize that it's not a luxury, that it's a necessity. It is what we are as human beings. It's how we communicate with each other. It's about human expression. Anybody should have the right to be able to express themselves. To learn more, visit stephanieron.com. In this next segment, artist Julie Green tells us about her thoughtful and provocative exhibit, The Last Supper. Green discusses her method and gives viewers a tour of the over 500 plates that comprise her exhibit, each with its own unique, dark story to tell. Take a look. I wanted to make something that brought the viewer in, that had a degree of beauty, so that they would look at the plates and then go, oh, that's what they're about. Each of these plates represents the final meal of a prisoner on death row. Julie Green was teaching art in Oklahoma when the idea came to her while reading the paper over breakfast. In Oklahoma at that time, there were many executions, highest per capita in the United States, still is, and so I just started saving these clippings. They bothered me. Oklahoma, 8 July, 1999. Six tacos, six glazed donuts, and a cherry Coke. Texas, 22 October, 2001. A bag of Jolly Ranchers. The project, as you can tell, has many different shapes of plates. They're all basically white or off-white. Most are porcelain, some are stoneware. Um, different sizes, they're almost all secondhand. When Martha Stewart was in prison, I did go to Kmart and buy uh, a Martha Stewart plate um, that I happened to notice. I wanted them all to be basically white, look uniform, look like a system, but not a matte set because they represent individuals. This is a Florida plate and for lobster, shrimp, baked potato, cheesecake, uh, and a drink. And the information came back. Um, he enjoyed his last meal, ate every bite. This is a North Carolina plate, one honey bun. When you walk into the gallery, it's this beautiful display of plates. It's almost homey. And uh, then the content is just a, a big flip. This is an Indiana plate and the words mother on the front from 2001. German ravioli and chicken dumplings prepared by his mother and prison dietary staff. So his mother actually received clearance to come into the prison kitchen and cook that meal. Julie's work draws from an approach to art in Mexico called retableau. Retableau in Mexican painting is like remembrance of something that will otherwise go unnoticed. These are um, Mississippi menus, 23 July, 1947, same, fried chicken, watermelon. He was only 16, he was only 15. There were two boys quickly convicted of murder. And executed by a traveling electric chair the next day. A traveling electric chair. I ordered those special from the China painting catalog 
because they were appropriate for those two meals. Because they were so young? Yeah, because they were so young. They're very small plates. They're, they're palm of the hand size. This is an Indiana plate, and the information from the Department of Corrections came back. He never had a birthday cake, so we ordered a birthday cake for him. It's very important. It is important uh, in the sense that it fulfills one of art's roles. There are many, but it makes us stand still and think. Think about something we don't really want to think about. Texas represents a third of all the plates, about a third of all the plates in the show. And these five Texas plates, um, consecutive in fall of 2007, had no final meal request had no final meal request, had no final meal request. This tells me that the inmates are aware of what other inmates are eating or not eating. The variety of the plates also reflect the different ways the states implement the death penalty. Oklahoma dropped its final meal allowance from $20 to 15. This plate represents the last final meal request granted in Texas. When the prisoner returned his meal untouched, the state stopped the practice. In many states are limited to what's on hand in the prison pantry. So you can really tell, like in Oklahoma, you get restaurant meals, same with California. And so those are more varied. This is an Oregon plate. Um, the request is five eggs sunny side up. Um, it's a breakfast meal, pancakes. And the request closed with, I would appreciate the eggs hot. One plate centers around pecan pie. An Arkansas inmate with brain damage ate half before his execution, thinking he could eat the other half after the execution was over. He didn't understand. He didn't understand. Yeah. There is misery in this whole process from the crime that was committed. Somebody was generally murdered. So there was victims, victims' family, so many levels of suffering. Part of my motivation for the project is that it generates conversation on our system of capital punishment. And, and it has done that to a far greater degree than I would have ever expected. The Last Supper depicts the most humane moment in a long chain of misery that starts and ends with death. By focusing on the mundane, limited choices of food, by putting them on grandma's china, and by staying true to the individual details of each meal, Julie Green hopes her art will cause more and more people to notice. It's one of the many reasons why she's still painting plates. I paint 50 a year. That's my plan to keep doing that um, until we don't have capital punishment anymore. Everybody has an opinion about capital punishment, actually, it seems like. And even my mom. It's changed my mom. So I figure, you know, right, I can't, I can't go about like trying to change people on capital punishment. But if it happens, um, that's fabulous. For more information, visit theartscenter.net. Over the last several years, street or graffiti art has made its way from the sides of buildings and bridges to museums across the country. Jared Bowen sits down with famous street artist Barry McGee, whose work, renowned for its anti-establishment perspective, is on display at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston. Find artist Barry McGee in the galleries of his retrospective at Boston's Institute of Contemporary Art, and you find a man in conflict. He's in tension with his life's work. It's, it's maybe like seeing, a, yeah, it's maybe like seeing an old friend that you never f quite finished the um, relationship with, right? Or mm. it's a little bit awkward. He's at odds with particular pieces. I wish it would go away. It's so, so obnoxious back then. Was it, was it the Branch Davidians in, in Waco, Texas? Yeah. Remember when they were using music to like get, get them to try to come out of the compound? Like this thing's been going for like the last half, like two days here. And for the man whose acclaim is derived from very public street art, the confines of the museum confound him. Going back indoors is like going backwards a little bit to me. Your audience is, it's, goes, it's it starts reducing the audience. There is a palpable sensitivity to Barry McGee, a one-time graffiti artist who made his mark in San Francisco beginning in the early 1990s. 
much of the show is populated with his melancholic figures, a reflection of the city's large homeless population, one that he encountered working, he says, late at night on San Francisco's fringe. That would be the population you're in touch with a lot yeah. when you're like uh, behind buildings and stuff. So it was, uh, yeah, it was an interesting to talk and just find out how people like end up in situations. I think in his work, a sort of uh, an homage or sort of an honoring another culture that's in the shadows, um, or community, I should say, a community that's in the shadows. The ICA's Janelle Porter curated the McGee Show, which takes us from the artist's earliest days, a time saturated in earthy brown and red tones, to a vibrant venture into abstraction. He also is just maturing more, looking at more art, thinking about more histories of painting and of art, but also trying to find a way to incorporate all of the like excess of the street in a way that was perhaps more abstracted. Here he comments on and uses excess. That blaring video tower, the dumpster bin, which has been inhabited, all created from found or discarded objects. I like to use anything outside of the art store for material, not, not going into art stores or that just became the material, I think, for me. Just as his life and culture is. For all of the darkness in tone, the biting commentary on consumption, the artist also has a crafty comedic side in the guise of animatronics, which Porter says is McGee at his deadpan best. I also think of it as sort of a diorama, like of the sort of, <laughs> this is the habitat of the, of the graffiti writer. Um, but as well, I think there's something um, that can be, there's something quite primitive, one could say, in doing graffiti, like if you want to trace it all the way back to cave paintings, like leaving your mark. And now it is also the mark of the mainstream in museums, troubling as that may be for a man of conflict like Barry McGee. For more information, visit ICABoston.org. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org slash artbeat where you'll find feature videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Artbeat Nation is made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you.